Okay, conservation of charge. There's a picture here. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the pictures. An even more fundamental reason for using positive and negative signs for electrical charge is that experiments show that charge is conserved according to this definition. In any closed, closed system, the total amount of charge is a constant. This is why we observe that rubbing initially uncharged substances together always has the result that one gains a certain amount of one type of charge while the other acquires an equal amount of the other type. Conservation of charge seems natural in our model in which matter is made of positive and negative particles. If the charge on each particle is a fixed property of that type of particle and if the particles themselves can be neither created nor destroyed then conservation of charge is inevitable. Electrical forces involving neutral objects. As shown in figure A, an electrically charged object can attract objects that are uncharged. How is this possible? The key is that even through each piece of paper, that even though each piece of paper has a total charge of zero, it has at least some charged particles in it that have some freedom to move. Suppose that the, that the tape is positively charged. B. Mobile particles in the paper will respond to the tape's forces causing one end of the paper to become negatively charged and the other to become positive. The attraction is between the paper and the tape. The attraction is between the paper and the tape is now stronger than the repulsion because the negatively charged end is close closer to the tape. What would happen if the tape was negatively charged? That's the self-check question. The path ahead. We have begun to encounter complex electrical behavior that we would never have realized was occurring just from the evidence of our eyes. Unlike the pulleys, blocks, and inclined planes of mechanics, the actors on the stage of electricity and magnetism are invisible phenomena, alien to our everyday experience. For this reason, the flavor of the second half of your physics education is dramatically different, focusing much more on experiments and techniques. Even though you will never actually see moving through a wire, even though you'll never actually see charge moving through a wire, you can learn to use an, an ammeter to measure the flow. Students also tend to get the impression from their first semester of physics that it is a dead science. Not so. We are about to pick up the historical trail that leads directly to the cutting edge physics research you read about in the newspaper. The atom smashing experiments that began around 1900, which we will be studying in chapters 1 and 2, were not that different from the ones of the year 2000. Just smaller, simpler, and much cheaper. Magnetic forces. A detailed mathematical treatment of magnetism won't come until much later in this book, but we need to develop a few simple ideas about magnetism now because magnetic forces are used in the experiments and techniques we come to next. Everyday magnets come in two general types. Permanent magnets, such as the ones your, refrig your refrigerator are made of, iron, or substances like steel that contain iron atoms. Certain other substances also work, but iron is the cheapest and most common. The other type of magnet, an example of which is the ones that make your stereo speakers vibrate, consist of coils of wire through which electric charge flows. Both types of magnets are able to attract iron that has not been magnetically prepared. For instance, the door of the refrigerator. A single insight makes these apparently complex phenomena much simpler to understand. Magnetic forces are interactions between moving charges, occurring in addition to the electrical forces. Suppose a permanent magnet is brought near a magnet of the coiled wire type. The coiled wire has moving charges in it because we force charge to flow. 
The permanent magnet also has moving charges in it, but in this case the charges that naturally swirl around inside the iron. What makes a magnetized piece of iron different from a block of wood is that the motion of the charge in the wood is random rather than organized. The moving charges in the coiled wire magnet exert a force on the moving charges in the permanent magnet and vice versa. The mathematics of magnetism is significantly more complex than the Coulomb force law for electricity, which is why we will wait until chapter 6 before delving deeply into it. Two simple facts will suffice for now. 1. If a charged particle is moving in a region of space near where other charged particles are also moving, their magnetic force on it is directly proportional to its velocity. 2. The magnetic force on moving charged particles is always per perpendicular to the direction the particle is moving. Example, a magnetic compass. The earth is molten inside, and like a pot of boiling water, it roils and churns. To make a drastic oversimplification, electric charge can get carried along with the churning motion, so the earth contains moving charge. The needle of a magnetic compass is itself a small permanent magnet. The moving charge inside the earth interacts magnetically with the moving charge inside the compass needle, causing the compass needle to twist around and point north. Example, a television tube. A TV picture is painted by a stream of electrons coming from the back of the tube to the front. The beam scans across the whole surface of the tube like a reader scanning a page of a book. Magnetic forces are used to steer the beam. As the beam comes from the back of the tube to the front, up, down, and left, right forces are needed for steering, but magnetic forces cannot be used to get the beam up to speed in the first place, since they can only push perpendicular to the electron's direction of motion, not forward along it. Probably in the recording here. Discussion questions. I'll read them. If the electrical attraction between two point-like objects at a distance of one meter is nine times ten, why can't we infer that their charges are plus one and minus one coulomb? What further observations would we need to do in order to prove this? B is another question. An electrically charged piece of paper will be attracted to your hand. Does that allow us to tell whether the mobile charged particles in your hand are positive or negative, or both?